Wednesday will mark 25 years since Princess Diana died after a car crash in a Paris tunnel. Her boys, who walked solemnly behind the casket a quarter century ago, are all grown up now. Of course, Prince William is preparing to be a king someday, and Harry has stepped back from the royal life, shall we say. Meanwhile, Prince Charles is still waiting in the wings as the queen remains on the throne at 96 years old. Tina Brown has a fascinating book out on all of it. The Palace Papers, Inside the House of Windsor, The Truth and the Turmoil. And she joins me now. So let me first start by asking you, Diana's death, I remember it vividly, and this feeling that almost there was a kind of break in the British body politic psyche. There was an eruption of emotion. What do you think that was all about? It was a remarkable moment, as you say, in the British psyche. Uh, it was a moment when the connection that Diana had forged, you know, her combination of royal uh, charisma, if you like, and humanitarian warmth, the way that she reached out to people and shared her pain, which was an absolutely new thing for any royal to do, as we know. It was the moment when you saw for the first time, really, the stiff upper lip of the English crumble, you know, tremble. And suddenly, you know, people from all walks of life, all age groups were, were weeping, weeping in the streets of London and indeed all over the world. And yet, you know, there is something that the Britons and, and people around the world seem to admire about that stiff upper lip when I think about the Queen, who has played this remarkable role of really never revealing anything. That's right. I mean, the Queen never explained, never complained. And of course, Diana did depart from that. And in the case of the Queen, of course, we know nothing about what she thinks about anything. Nothing. 70 years on the throne, not a clue what she thinks. She's inscrutable, and she has actually perfected the art of allowing anyone to project what they want on her. We can all look at her and think she's upset, she's amused, she's pleased. I mean, you know, the famous boot face at the weddings, which always makes me laugh, and you know, everyone else at weddings is crying or looking, you know, oh, it's so sweet. She is 100% inscrutable, and that is the way she has always been. But it must take incredible discipline to do that, because as you say, not only do we not know anything about what she thinks about anything, uh, and these are big state matters, personalities, we never will. There will never be a, a memoir written by, by this woman who has been at the center of international life. And it's kind of, it's so different from our modern age, where even people who seem inscrutable like a president, you know within five years you're going to get a memoir that tells you everything. With her, there's never going to be anything. Well, she has had this remarkable self-discipline, and she always has, actually. I mean, you know, right from her earliest girlhood, the Queen was always noted to be, you know, remarkably composed, remarkably serious-minded. She had absorbed the whole concept of duty and of reserve from her father, King George VI, and has never really erred from it at all. And, of course, what was hard for the Queen when Diana died was suddenly she was required to be something else. She had always, all her life, it followed this, this, this creed of composure and reserve, and all of a sudden she was being asked to emote. She said the British people all of a sudden wanted her to be crying, wanted her to say, I'm so upset about the death of my daughter. That's not what the Queen can do, and that was really the only time that she put a foot wrong, in a sense, with her people, because that's what they wanted at that particular moment. With this backdrop, what do you think of what the Sussexes have done, you know, Harry and Meghan? <laughs> Well, they've gone in completely the other direction. Now they're all about emotion all the time, you know. And, of course, the Oprah interview stunned and, dis, you know, and, and absolutely floored the, the royal family. Uh, in a way, it was almost more puzzling and, and traumatic for them than Diana's famous interview, you know, with Martin Bashir, because they'd almost come to expect from Diana these kind of uh, news bombs and, 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 and revealing of herself by that time. But in this case, I think the, the puzzle was like, why? Why are they, why are they doing this? Um, and I think that it actually, I think there was a possibility for them to build a bridge, you know, with the family after they left. But the Oprah interview seemed like a hand grenade into the House of Windsor that they still haven't really recovered from. And, and it seemed to me it was sort of like the, the, there was a fundamental break with the, with the business model, if you will, of the royal family, as, as I've understood it. You know, you, if you're a member of the British royal family, you get enormous respect, dignity, worldwide publicity, acclaim. But 
you behave in a certain way and you don't monetize the brand that that really is frowned upon and what Harriet seemed almost like he suddenly realized wait a minute I why do I have to live off the scraps that that you know Charles gives me I can do a Netflix deal <laughs> right and in many ways I mean a lot of people that I spoke to almost felt it was always going to happen that, that Harry would leave. He just couldn't figure out a way to do it. And uh, what Meghan gave him, of course, was a way out. And where does Prince Charles, uh, presumably soon to bec become king, <laughs> <laughs> where does he fit into all this? Well, Charles has been the man who waited, you know, in the ante room of his destiny for the last, you know, 50 years and has waited and waited and waited. So he's felt tremendous frustration in his own life, but he's hung on. And now he gl glimpses it. And you saw when he had to open uh, a parliament recently when the queen was too ill to do, well, too unwell to do so. It was almost like a melancholy occasion. It was almost like here he is, still not king, kind of almost looking forlornly at the crown <laughs> on, a, on a cushion. Opening parliament once again for his mother. It was like, when is he going to be able to step into his destiny? Will he still you know, have any years left. So he's waiting patiently. I actually think he will be a pretty good transitional monarch. It won't be a long reign, but you know, he will be a good convening king, I think, you know? And, and it does feel though that this issue in, it, in, the a, in an age we live in of the super wealth, the, the, the issue of money, uh, you know, s somehow still sneaks its way around with the royal family because at the end of the day, other than the queen and her state wealth, they're not actually that well off. And so you not. see Andrew doing a lot of what he did, hobnobbing with rich people. You see Prince Charles trying to fundraise from Middle Eastern guys and taking cash in bags. It's a very vexatious issue for them all. They are more and more exposed to what money could bring them. It's like, it's like a mirage, you know, and actually it does sort of lead them astray in a sense because they have to figure out other ways to get it. And usually that is something that gets them into trouble. It's like mixing with the wrong people or doing some kind of deal that when it comes public, it's not attractive in any way. And of course with Andrew, it totally you know, sent him off the reservation and ended up you know, in the thralls of Jeffrey Epstein. So it is actually a vexatious matter. And I think you're going to see in William and Kate's era, I feel very much that the younger children are gonna be said, okay, go, go forth, you know, you know, God be with you. Don't feel you have to be royal in any way. It's for the heir. If the heir doesn't want to do it, we have to ask the next one. But I don't think that you're going to have this imprisonment, essentially, of the younger royals, where actually their fate is to be behaved as perfectly as the monarch, but at the same time have none of the, frankly, the perks or the income or the, you know, the status.